Have you heard of the Apache dance? It's a truly bizarre dance with an especially physical dynamic between a man and a woman, you might say. In Irene Castle's words, this was a dance, quote, in which the male dancer tries to demolish the female dancer as spectacularly as possible and usually succeeds, close quote. So why is this relevant to us as folk dancers? It's neither a social dance nor a folk dance. So why do we care? Because it strongly influenced two vernacular social dances, tango and waltz. One of the primary topics of my own research is vernacular social dance. Vernacular as in grassroots, from the people. We usually call this folk dance, but all folk dances aren't necessarily rural, you know. The original waltz probably was, but both tango and swing are urban folk dances, created by ordinary people, not dancing masters, as grassroots movements in cities, Buenos Aires, New York City. So today's talk will be relevant in that way. And it's a fascinating story by itself, as you will see. So what is the Apache dance? The best way to define it is to simply describe it. I'll describe an Apache dance based on descriptions by Maurice Mouvet, shown here, who performed it in Paris in 1908, and Carolyn and Charles Caffin, who described it in 1912. For those who may think that this description may be a little bit politically incorrect until you hear the real story, I should mention that this is an original description, not my own words. The setting is a Parisian hangout of the underworld, home of lost souls, where La Valse Chalopé, the waltz of the Apache, is played by an old violinist and a hunchback at a rattlebone piano. A man lays down his poker hand and saunters through the tables with the deliberation of a cat. He halts and fixes his gaze on one of the girls. She feels the sway of it. Compliance, repulsion, she cannot resist. He demands money from her. She turns out her empty pockets. He is suspicious and demands. She refuses. He raises his hand and smacks her across the mouth. Quote, it was a novel way to begin a dance. He catches her violently in his arms. They walk in a grim, stealthy stalking. This grows more and more rapid into a blurred, pivoting whirl, then slows down. He draws her to him, sheltering her body with his own. She bends and twists her body. She looks into his eyes. Suddenly, as if stung, he grabs her throat and forces her head back, dipping her low, holding her as he would a snake. Then he hurls her away from him. He will be master. He won't give in to female allure. She crouches, proud of what she can incite. Remember, I'm not making up these words. He grabs her wrist and swings her body against his, then down into another dip. They spin around and around. He drops her into a deeper dip. They recover and whirl even faster. He dashes her away onto the floor again. He grabs her by her hair and fiercely pulls her back onto her feet. He throws her this way and that. The dance quickens into a mad accelerando, then stops. He forces her body across his thigh and thrusts her head back in submission. He returns to his table and picks up his poker hand as if there had been no interruption. Close quote. Now, I didn't want to digress from that drama to tell you about this photo a few slides back, but this one was given to me by an older international folk dancer friend of mine, Mario Cassetta. Maybe you knew him. And these two dancers are his parents. Okay, back to our story. It's surprising that such a bizarre dance would remain a popular cabaret act throughout the world for 80 years, through the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 1950s, through the 1960s, 70s, including Ron Howard's Apache on Happy Days. That was 1978. 1980s, like Bruce Willis's Apache dance on Moonlighting, that was 1986. 
and it's still occasionally done in France today as a cabaret act. Now, a common misperception today about the Apache is that it was condoned violence against women. Another misconception is that the Apache was male backlash against emerging women's independence and freedoms at the turn of the last century. And I think it's certainly understandable why people have believed these things, given the appearance of the dance. But the real story is more interesting than that. In fact, the Apache dance was created by a woman, Miss Tinguette, as a statement of independence and empowerment for her. Sometimes it was performed by two women, as you see here, when taking the man's role, and here by the Sidel sisters, in a more violent pose. Now, if you're a historian, you know that one of the most common pitfalls in the field is judging earlier events by today's standards. History is a one-way street that only moves forward in time from an earlier perspective. And the only way to understand the motives that propelled events forward is to understand the mindsets of the previous era. Women's independence and empowerment have come a long way in the past century. And if you judge the Apache by today's standards, you will miss the significance that this dance had for women back then. So, Throughout the 19th century, Parisian women were confined by restrictions and double standards. Married women were considered to be the property of her husband, who also legally owned whatever property she used to have. Women were told to be passive and submissive to men. A double standard allowed a man to go out at night and mingle with others while his wife had to stay home and tend the household. This was the doctrine of the separate spheres. That's actually the 19th century term, going back to 1851, shown here. Then in Paris, women started to enjoy some temporary freedoms from this confinement, especially at carnival time, in which it was common to break many society rules. Women could dress and behave as men, could smoke cigars, they could behave badly. And then the 19th century ball public, the outdoor dance gardens, gave Parisian women an opportunity to establish a degree of liberation from the social mores and restrictions at that time, but now in a year-round way, not just at carnival time. A growing number of women began to enjoy the new freedoms that were allowed and encouraged at the public dance gardens, enough to nudge the mainstream in that direction. For the first time, some Parisian women chose how they would lead their lives. It wasn't perfect, but it began a momentum in the direction of women's independence and emancipation from the double standard of the 19th century, the emancipation of women. One of these women was Miss Tenguet. She dared to step out of the private domestic sphere into the public eye, performing as a singer and a dancer on stage around 1900. We'll come back to Miss Tenguet. But first, we will look at the underworld of the Apache at this time, for whom this dance was named, going back to about 1900. These were a group of street gangs in Montmartre, Belleville, and the Barriere. The Barriere was an especially dangerous part of Paris. These gangs committed crimes of great violence that in turn were covered heavily in the local newspapers. These thugs were mostly young men, 16 to 25 years old, who swaggered with an arrogant pride, dressed distinctively with that kind of a hat, and were handy with a knife. Since you already know that the Apache dance was about an Apache thug roughing up a woman as a dance, I should point out that the real Apache gangs did not target women in particular you will see that that was a complete fiction. So where did the Apache name come from? Well, after a particularly heinous crime in 1902, the newspaper reporter Arthur Dupin wrote 
a headline about a crime committed by the Apaches in the Chappelle district, referring to the perceived savagery of the Native Americans that were described in James Fenimore Cooper novels that were popular at that time, and the French author Gustave Amer. The French pronounce it Apache, and the term stuck for that kind of a criminal. Now, for the Apache dance, we'll skip ahead six years to 1908. Max Dearly was a Parisian entertainer, an actor, and a dancer. And I already mentioned the American dancer Maurice Mouvet, born in New York City but working in Paris in 1908. Maurice was the Apache dancer that we first saw in today's presentation. These two men, Max Dearly and Maurice Mauve, both claim to have invented the Apache dance in 1908. Now, it's true that Max Dearly performed it in 1908 with Miss Tanguet at the Moulin Rouge, as depicted in this sheet music cover. That was the mainstream debut of the dance, where most of Paris first saw it. By the way, note that he is holding her wrist as a gesture of dominant control so that she can't hold his hand back. You've seen that earlier. And I know this is obvious, but I need to point out for later reference that the male Apache was establishing dominance with the wrist hole and looking down over a reclining female looking upward. That posture is all about dominance. Now, can you read that in the upper right-hand corner? The Apache's Dance, created and arranged by Monsieur Max Dearly. Being a self-promoter, he had probably organized the design of that cover. But later on, Miss Tinget claimed that it was her, not either of those two men, who originated the concept. Who was telling the truth? Well, either way, the Apache became a sensation. Maurice and Miss Linguette also performed it in a silent film that same year, here, 1908. Here is a poster of Miss Linguette and Dearly's 1908 Apache. Another drawing of them. This painting of Dearly and Miss Linguette by Keith Max was very large. How large? Here it is, with Dearly and Miss Linguette posing for it. However, every source I have found, from 1910 to all of today's conference papers and web pages on the subject, pass on the story that one of these two men created the Apache dance, usually just creating Max Dearly. But when Miss Tinget wrote her autobiography later in her life, she claimed that she had created the concept well before 1908 and that Max Dearly was only one of her later partners. Here's a conference paper on the Apache, and you can see that the author doubts Miss Tinget's claim. So, which side was telling the truth? Miss Tinget was, and I found proof. Here's the story. One of the hottest dance crazes in Paris in 1900 was the American cakewalk, Le Cakewalk. It was an African-American creation, but it became even more popular in Paris than it was in the U.S., truly. To quote a Parisian magazine article about Miss Tinguet, During the last season, there was not one concert, not one music hall, which did not feature a cakewalk. So, of course, Miss Tinguet added the cakewalk to her repertoire. She's on the right. Then she created specialized cakewalks. But with these, she just used the popular name, cakewalk, which was the rage, applying it to very different kinds of dances, not the original cakewalk. Here is Miss Tinguet's cakewalk Parisienne, as opposed to the cakewalk American. Now, this was a low-class, bear-like hugging dance, described in a 1903 issue of Paris qui chante a magazine of popular music and dance. It was like a circus act, and this rough cakewalk was a performed entertainment, usually in cabarets, not a true social dance. 
Now, from my other research and publication patterns, I'm estimating that if this was published in early 1903, then Mistinget probably conceived and developed it in 1902. So then, with a Mr. Paolo as her partner, Mistinget invented the cakewalk of the barriere. Do you remember the barriere? Yes, this new cakewalk was a mock fight as a dance between a hooligan from the low-class barriere and a woman. This new dance was described with photos in that same issue of Paris Quichat. The illustrations show a rough hooligan violently threatening a woman and pulling her by her hair. Ah, you remember that from my earlier Apache description. The article described the dance as, quote, vulgar and amazing at the same time. Like her other cakewalk, this mock battle was an entertainment. It was a fiction. Miss Singet never stated that there were any actual prototypes of men choreographically abusing women in reality. This was a fantasy that she made up. Now, this dance was also going by other names, La Valle Chaloupe, or Swaying Waltz, and later as the Danse Apache and Valse Apache. Now, skipping ahead to when the Apache dance became very popular, after Max Dearly claimed to have invented it in 1908, we see this postcard illustration of it. Now, do you recognize that pose? It's exactly copied from Miss Tinget's 1902 original. And the thug is holding the woman's wrist. And that also goes back to her 1902 original. As you recall now, 1902 was also the year that the reporter, Arthur Dupin, coined the term Apache for this class of men. So it took a couple of years for that term to spread from the name of the hooligans to the name for this cakewalk. Here we see, can you see in the corner, the cakewalk of the Apache. And here we see that the name of Mistinget's innovation quickly evolved into the cakewalk Apache with both forms illustrated, the newer choreographed fight on the left and the older cakewalk dance on the right. Now, this postcard has a 1904 calendar printed on the back, and calendars are usually printed at the end of the previous year. So this illustration is probably from late 1903. That's still five years before Dearly and Mouvet claimed to have invented the Apache dance that's shown on the left. Now, in 1905, 6, and 07, Newspaper reports of the Apache gangs increased as the cakewalk fad faded away. So the cakewalk name became passé and the name Apache stuck, as did the choreographed brawl version of the dance. But it didn't matter what the dance is called. The Barriars cakewalk, Val Chalopé, or Apache. It's the concept that counts, and Miss Tinget created it. Now, she chose as her next partner, Maurice Chevalier, with whom she had been doing other cabaret routines. Some of you know who he was. Then, six years after she created this dance, she chose Max Dearly as her next partner. And, of course, Dearly, being in the business of self-promotion, claimed this successful new dance as his own. I'm really happy to have this photo postcard signed by both of them. Now, on to another important facet of the Apache. The actress portraying the Apache's female partner was not a victim of abuse. The actress was making a statement that she didn't have to remain in the cage of the domestic sphere. And furthermore, she could stand up to a man in a public physical arena. She willingly, even enthusiastically, entered that public space. Notice that she's smiling. You will see more of that. There is much evidence to support this fact. You'll see. So here's a very short film clip, one of the earliest Apache films, from the 1916 silent film Les Vampires, The Vampires. And you will notice that the woman is smiling and confident as they set out. You will also see the waltz step for the Valse of the Apache, and you'll hear that original tune that is always used. Now, 
Now, I hope I'm making a clear disambiguation between the actress and the role that she's playing. Yes, Miss Tinget did portray a woman as a victim in order to portray men as cruel brutes. But for Miss Tinget herself and for the actresses who wanted to perform it, it was a statement of independence from the roles that society at that time preferred for women. Now let's watch the most famous filmed Apache scene from the 1935 movie Charlie Chan in Paris. You will see that the star who is announced is the woman, Mamzelle Nardi, played by Dorothy Appleby. Incidentally, Appleby was not a trained Apache dancer. She was an actress. This was her 12th film. The male Apache dancer remains anonymous to this day. You'll see Mamzelle Nardi give a smile at the beginning, then a big smile at the end. A smile of achievement, at least before the Charlie Chan murder plot kicks in about her. But there is pride. There is considerable skill and strength in that performance. And that's how Miss Tinget created the dance, as a statement of independence. So if you think that outsider performance art is a recent phenomenon, well, think a century earlier. So here is that performance. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have that little star whose interpretation of the dance of Pash I know will thrill you, Mademoiselle Nardi. <laughs> Now, one might argue that the man also exhibited strength and skill, which is true. But the only dancer who is announced is the woman, Mademoiselle Nardi, played by Miss Appleby. The male Apache dancer remains anonymous. Not even IMDb lists the dancer who played the male Apache, which would not be the case if the Apache dance was a dance about a man dominating a woman. In the Apache dance, the woman was the star, not the man. I could give many more examples of early Apache publicity that only mention the female dancer by name, including the Apache in the 1925 film, The Masked Bride, which only mentions Mae Murray, and never her Apache partner, who was the famous Buster Keaton. Again, not even IMDb mentions Keaton's role as the male Apache dancer. Dorothy Graham was assisted by Monsieur Armand. She was the star. And these women were proud of taking that role. 
Take a look at this photo of the Apache cabaret routine by Lafayette and Laverne. It looks like she's an unwilling victim of abuse, being strangled. And she wrote on her photo, to my mother and daddy from Laverne. And she's obviously happy with that dance. And this one, all good wishes, Beatrice Collier. Now, usually when I illustrate a talk with my photos, it's hard to come up with 250 images for this talk. But in this case, I have more than 100 more Apache illustrations in my collection that I'm using to tell the story today. It was an extremely popular dance. So let's just take a minute to look at a few more. Carrying her over the shoulder. A couple more here. The one on the left reminds some people of the Three Stooges for some reason. This version of the Apache looks convincingly violent. Notice that it's Beatrice Collier with Bert Sinden. Here is Beatrice Collier with a different partner, Fred Farron, dressed in the same costume. Like Miss Tinget and the others, Beatrice Collier was the star, not the man. Now, this is in England, not France. The Apachentanz was very popular in Germany. And this is immediately after Dearly and Miss Tinget in 1908. Here is the Apache dance in Denmark, the next year, 1909. Czech Apache from Prague in 1912, when it was still Bohemia, before it became Czechoslovakia. Moscow, 1909. This is also Russian Apache. This one's 1911. Spain. Here is Apache in Argentina. These Apache cherubs are Italian. Actual children dancing the Apache. And midgets. Here is Apache in Slovenia. And here it's in Mexico. You can see how far this dance has spread. Irish Apache is odd. Even odder is a posh in a Japanese setting with non-Japanese women portraying geishas. So the Apache dance became a part of popular culture. You could buy Apache dancer dolls. And to show how seriously this dance was taken, look at the detailing on this beautiful large sculpture of Mistinget and Dearly's Apache. This one is at my home right here. It's a foot and a half tall. I don't think you can tell, but if you look closely at the real sculpture, you can tell that the sculptor portrayed Miss Tinget as smiling. Here is another different one. So these were large, and this Apache couple is tiny. Talcum powder. I found two of these cans. Apache dancer jewelry was quite popular with several different designs that people enjoyed wearing. This is a flask produced in Germany. Even today, you can get Danse à Pache beer on tap in France. Now, back in the 1930s, the Apache appeared in several cartoons, yes, for children, including Crazy Cat, Walt Disney's Silly Symphonies, and Popeye. Now, here's the strange part of this last one. The Apache dance was just one scene in a seven-minute cartoon called The Dance Contest, 1934, with several kinds of dance, foxtrot, waltz, and Apache. But then, during the 1950s, Atlas Films took only the two-minute violent Apache scene and sold it as a, quote, kiddie movie. Can you see that? screened at birthday parties for impressionable little kids. Back to live action Apache dances. Here is German Apache on roller skates. An American Apache on ice skates. She is screaming for effect. And how about underwater Apache in Florida? So you can see how widespread the popularity of this dance was and how long it lasted. 
Now, returning to the cultural dynamics of the Apostates, here is another important observation. If you watch any film of the French Apache, you will notice that the audience is always included in the frame because the Apache dance was a cabaret act based on a fiction, not a recreation of actual domestic violence. So the audience is an important part of the picture. Hey, going back a few slides, the audience is so important that in the underwater Apache, the postcard put the audience underwater. And look at who is in the audience watching, behind the dancers. Women are prominently in the audience. Contrary to the myth that the Apash catered to male fantasies. And finally, in the early versions of the Apash, it didn't matter who won the brawl. The aim of the act was to portray the Apash thug as a cruel brute. But in the later versions, from the 1940s on, including Cole Porter's 1953 musical Can Can, filmed in 1960, the women usually ended up turning the tables and winning the battle. And another. And another. And another. This caption at the bottom says this was called a reverse Apache dance, with the women throwing the man around. Here the woman is doing the same thing with a puppet partner. And the caption on the back of this photo says, the rougher the girl dancer treats her dummy partner, the better. Okay, next we'll see the influence of the Apache dance on the Argentine tango. Three years ago, during our Stockton Zoom winter weekend, I gave a 90-minute talk on the history of the tango. We certainly don't have time to recap all of that, but I should briefly mention that the world first saw Argentine tango not in Argentina, but in Paris. The original tango traveled from Buenos Aires to Paris at the same time that the Apache dance hit it big, 1908. Now, we know the original steps and styles and figures from the dance manual El Tango Argentino de Salon by the Argentine tango master Nicanor Lima, written in Buenos Aires. The original style that Lima described was based on simple walking with combinations of slow and quick steps. The stance was quietly erect as the dancers worked out both simple and complex figures. Now, this slight lowering style was as low to the floor that you would ever get in the original Argentine tango. There was not a single mention or illustration or even implication of any dips or lunges in the original Argentine tango. It was quiet, understated, erect walking. We know this not only from the many illustrations and photographs from this period, but also from the author's words. The Argentine tango master wrote, the gentleman must have a simple and unexaggerated style of dancing. But we don't think of the tango as a quiet, understated walking dance, do we? Most people think of the tango as a dance of smoldering passion, sometimes with an aggressive flavor and with dramatic dips. So where does that come from? And now you know, of course, it's the influence of the Parisian Apache. The two forms mixed influences between 1908 and 1912. After seeing the Apache, tango dancers added dramatic Apache poses to the dance, elements that did not exist in the Argentine tango. Here's a photograph of the original Buenos Aires tango partnering style in Argentina, quiet, vertical, and understated, as Lima said. Here is the Apache, here is tango after seeing the Apache. Original tango in Buenos Aires, notice the upright style. Apache, tango after seeing the Apache. Original Argentine tango, the Apache, and tango after the Apache. Original tango, Apache, tango after the Apache. Continuing in Buenos Aires today. The Apache dance, tango today. 
Certainly the influence of the Apache is evident here in these early Russian tango photos. By early, I mean Apache influenced tango style within only four years of Parisians first seeing the tango from Argentina. And Argentines soon brought it back to Buenos Aires and adopted the Apache influence as their own style, continuing to today. I find it interesting that many Argentines today claim that the French tamed their tango and made it too mild. The opposite is true. The Argentines imported much of their most dramatic style from the French Apache. Here is one of the earliest Apache photos that looked nothing like Argentine tango at the time. And now this is Buenos Aires exhibition tango today. So I want to clarify that the original Argentine tango did have passion. It still does. Lima said, tango is our soul. But that was a quieter passion, intimate and introspective, shared only between two people, not displayed for everyone to see. So instead of the common claim that the French tamed the tango, removing the more dramatic and passionate elements, the truth is the opposite, that Buenos Aires got much of the grand drama and this performed passion from the French. But here I do want to emphasize that this was performed tango. This was for audiences. Social tango Argentino, that's quiet. That's more introspective. That doesn't have dips and lunges. Now, before we leave the tango, Here's a minor aside about the tango and the apache. You've all seen the red rose in tango dancing, right? Where did that come from? Here's Tango Barbie. Well, according to several sources, the first appearance of the red rose in tango was in 1924, as you read here, Rudolph Valentino's film, Blood and Sand. And that indeed seems to be true for the tango. But where did the tango get it from? And you already know, don't you? Because you've been seeing it in the Apache, going back to Mistinget in Dearly's 1908 Moulin Rouge debut, when she chose to hold a rose in her teeth. Here it is that same year, 1908, in London, when Vaubert and Silve copied Mistinget and Dearly's act, including the rose. Again in 1910, in a silent film starring Polaire. I like this Apache series of photographs where he begins with the rose in the teeth and she ends up with it. So now you know where the rose in the teeth in tango comes from. Another thing that the tango picked up from the Apache dance. Okay, final part of my talk. Back when I showed the influence of the tango from the original upright Argentine tango to the Apache, to the tango after seeing the Apache, I also could have shown the influence of the Apache in today's competition ballroom waltz. Here is waltz before seeing the Apache, the Apache, modern competition ballroom waltz. Social waltz, the Apache, competition ballroom waltz. Social Waltz, the Apache, Competition Ballroom Waltz. And all of these photographs are waltz, not tango. Now, is this an actual correlation between Apache and waltz or just a coincidental similarity? Well, you will see. So this is international style competition ballroom waltz, also known as dance sport. Now, international style, by the way, that's a euphemism for British style. That term was created by the Imperial Society of Teachers of Dancing. They call it international style to give a more universal image to this very English style. And indeed, this has now become a universal style in dance sport all over the world. Now, in case you're wondering, did Richard just find a few extreme images of ballroom waltz? No, this is the definitive Wiki Encyclopedia ideal supine posture, with the follows upper body arched back, almost horizontal. 
Here is the Encyclopedia of Dance Sport. Here is the Arthur Murray Studios. Schedule your free dance lesson now. It's also the standard posture for slow waltz, for old and young, the youth. That posture is very ballroom. Now, up to this point, I have been presenting objective facts, and I will continue to do so, but I have a responsibility to point out that I do have a personal bias with this topic. I don't really like this waltz posture for several reasons. The main reason I don't like it is because I know how and why that posture evolved. Was this posture taken directly from the apostance? Well, no. The tango did. The correlation between the apache and the ballroom waltz posture is the intent of that posture in both cases. I own almost every issue of the British Dancing Times magazine from 1910 to 1951. And these are only half of them. And I've read them. There is a clear record year by year of British male ballroom dancers complaining about women backleading or failing to comply. These complaints began shortly after women won the right to vote. Then, for the first time ever in social dancing, there were complaints and statements like this. I think you can read this, yes? Yes, that was in response to those days of sex equality. This is a declaration to retake dominance. Here's another. Note that it's a complaint about a woman ever criticizing a man. When can a woman assert a complaint? Never. Here is a similar statement by a British ballroom champion. Now, this next one was not an obscure quote. It was featured prominently in the April 1934 issue of the Dancing Times magazine, which was read by every serious ballroom dancer at the time. Taking that last comment, she must not have a mind of her own even farther. So I call the 1930s through the 50s the dark ages of ballroom dance. So earlier I described the follows posture in today's ballroom waltz as supine. That is the precise term for the posture of someone laying backward with their face upward. But there is much more going on here in the relationship between people. There is a second definition of supine. Read number two. Here is further clarification. Notice it's not about a posture, but entirely about a relationship between two people, one dominant and the other subservient. The Britannica Dictionary is just as clear. Can you read that one? One is a posture, and two is a relationship to others, willing to be controlled by others. Here is Merriam-Webster's thesaurus. Read through these and you will see that every one is what those 1930s British male ballroom dancers wanted their dancing partners to be. Supine behavior, definition two, is manifested in the supine posture, definition one. Submissive behavior expressed in a dance posture. The follow can also look to the side, usually toward the left, but always with a submissive horizontal upper torso. So how does this fix that complaint that so many men had about women backleading and having a mind of their own? Easy. If the women can't see where they're going, they can't backlead. It's simple and it works. Now, personally, I like it when my partner looks around the floor to see where we're going as a couple. My blind spot when we're spinning is behind my back, right? 
And my partners can see there, right in front of them, if there is oncoming trouble. Perfect. There have been many times when I was about to spin into somebody who suddenly cut in behind me, and my partner saved us both by catching us before a collision. That is a real partnership. Too many ballroom dancers call that back leading and respond angrily. So they devised a posture that will prevent follows from ever being able to do that again. Now, polite British dance students usually follow the rules without question, but American students keep on asking pesky questions like, why do we have to do this? So American ballroom teachers have to come up with a plausible answer. But every time I ask a ballroom teacher this question, the answer is always different. There seems to be no general consensus. Here is one answer. Okay, that sounds plausible, but is it true? Are the leads really leaning back as much as follows to balance them? I'm sorry, but that answer is just not true. Now, exactly how far must the follow arch back? It says as possible. Different teacher, different explanation of why. Is that true? Well, take a look. These are all early British ballroom dance champions, including the famous Victor Sylvester. And all of them are maintaining body contact while keeping their weight over the supporting feet. So is the follow supine posture really necessary? As the caption at the bottom says, these are the first British professional champions when at the top of their form. So no, the supine posture is not necessary for that reason. Some of the reasons for supine posture are found online like this one. No, the rules say, don't do it. Now tell me, is she really invading her partner space? Is that even close to a valid argument for supine posture? The next ballroom teacher is a good friend of mine, so I don't want to mention his name, because his reason is just too ridiculous. I asked him the question by email, and this was his exact reply. Yes, looking at your partner totally intellectualizes the partnership and kills the mood, right? Really? Do you think so? Clearly, never looking at your partner is a much better mood, for the waltz is a very romantic dance. Movies know this, and movies know how to show the mood of a real connection between waltzing partners. You have never once seen the ballroom supine posture in a movie waltz. So let's watch a short clip. They are not killing the mood by looking at each other. Now compare that to seeing the supine posture in ballroom waltz. You will notice that she assumes the subservient posture before she even touches him. I don't need slides anymore. So I wonder why every time I ask a ballroom teacher the reason for the prescribed supine posture, I get a different answer. And I think it's because they can't talk about the real reason. And to be fair to them, they probably don't even know. So importantly, these leads are not jerks. Most of them are kind, polite, and respectful. They probably would like their partners to have a good time. They're just doing what they're told to do. So are the follows. So are the teachers. They're merely passing on the rules that they were told. And the judges in the competitions, they're also good people, just doing their jobs.
They know the style rules that they should be using in their evaluations. The women should lean back as far as possible. And then they see a couple in which the follow is arching back even further than ever seen before. Wow, okay, they win. And the other competitors see that win. And they know that they need to up their game and arch the follow back even further. That's how all ballroom extremes evolve. Doing it more wins. Now, what happens if the follow of a couple in a competition doesn't assume the supine position? They don't even survive the elimination round. That's when everyone is on the floor at once and half are tapped out, even before the evaluation starts. Arch way back or be eliminated. But I want to say again that these ballroom dancers we've been looking at are really nice people. So are the teachers and the judges. We all understand having a passion for dancing, right? They're just following their rules. If the competitors don't, they're eliminated from the competition. They have no choice. My beef is with the men who made the follow supine posture the rule back then in the dark ages of ballroom dance. And why? So to return to the tie-in with the Apache dance, the supine ballroom position clearly began with men wanting to reestablish dominance. Now, men, in these days of sex equality, you can take heart from the fact that on the dance floor, the man is still the boss. The supine posture was about dominance, which was also what the male Apache dancer was doing. That's the tie-in. A supine female is the universal posture of male dominance in all cultures. Take a look at this. Now which dancer is dominant and which is subservient? The relative postures say it all. And in the world of partner dancing, the Apache dance did it first. But I'm not quite finished with this waltz topic. There are two more reasons why I don't like the prescribed supine posture in the waltz. In waltzing, we want followers to have the maximum positive experience in this very ethereal dance of the waltz, right? And a large part of what we experience as leads or follows is what we see. That's a major component of any experience. So see your partner. See them enjoying dancing with you. See the other dancers swirling around you. How wonderful it all is. Soak it in. That's what I don't like about the follows prescribed supine posture. Leads can look everywhere and gather vivid visual experiences, but follows must always look back and to the side or upward at the ceiling, which denies a complete dance experience. What visual memories swirl through a follows mind when going home from the ball? And finally, the wonderful waltz has the fewest differences between lead and follow of any partner dance. Ivan Suarez mentioned that in his essay that I read yesterday. Both roles have identical footwork, face shifted three steps. Both help rotate each other. And follows help navigate through a crowded dance floor, as I mentioned. Now, there are some necessary differences between the lead and follow roles, of course. And we have been succeeding in finding ways to minimize the differences and maximize the similarities between the two roles. So I think that follow should at least have the minimum agency of being able to look where they want to and see what they want to see, to be as close as an equal partnership with a lead as possible. And that's my talk. This was just my opinion. Everyone has their own preferences. So please feel free to disagree, each to their own. And you know that I'm not faulting any of the ballroom dancers or teachers for following their rules. We all share a love of dancing. We will save our criticisms for people who are doing true harm in the world, not for someone whose dance style preferences differ from our own. I hope you enjoyed my talk.